students, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker for today, who has very kindly consented to give a lecture on the interrelationships between economy and environment. We all know that there is a very close connection between environment and economy. A good environment is essential for a sound economy inhabited by happy and healthy people. On the other hand, sustainable economy is essential for a sound environment. However, an inverse relationship has been observed between economic growth and quality environment because economic growth is accompanied by increasing exploitation of natural resources obtained from our environment. Moreover, modern industrial and agricultural practices have made us greedy and insensitive to the state of environment. In the process, we have shifted from sustainable to non-sustainable livelihood practices. Today, we are living in a vicious circle of ambition, greed, over-exploitation of resources and environment pollution. I won't delve deep into the details of the topic of discussion because we have a very learned environment economist today, Professor Pritam Singh Ji. He will shed light on the ways and means to have sustainable economies along with a healthy environment. Sir, I once again welcome you on behalf of our, our institution and express my gratitude to you for sparing your valuable time for us. That new economic activities must be informed by environmental considerations. For example, if you want to improve transport, you must improve public transport and not create more conditions for car use. Because car is a monster, environmental monster. It looks very beautiful and very attractive, but when you go into the, you know, the pollution which the car creates, it is, it is very harmful. And one, one way of reducing car use is to increase public, uh, public transport efficiency. And that public sector should also be based on use of renewable energy. And many cities are practicing this, that uh, they are using buses, which are hybrid buses, which use one source of energy, which is electricity, produced by uh, uh, renewable sources, but it may not be sufficient, so there you have also petrol being used. The second could be redesigning the roads, that more cycling can take place. For example, in Oxford, each road has a section which is colored green, and only cyclists can, can, can get into it. And of course, those who are going in cars, similarly, some of you might have heard about Amsterdam, and uh, uh, that's true of whole of Netherlands, but especially Amsterdam. There are huge special lanes for cyclists. So we have to redesign the economy. Similarly, the buildings, we have to redesign the buildings. So we are not saying that don't create more buildings, okay? So economic growth can take place. But if we, if we create buildings which are energy efficient, we will have to think about new jobs. We will have to create green uh, electricians, green plumbers, uh, green construction workers uh, who are trained into these conditions. So we use less energy and we can, we can, we can have greenhouses, a greenhouse in the sense of environmentally friendly houses. And one of them is having more solar panels. So those economic activities should be expanded. And those economic activities should be reduced, need to grow. We are not saying that don't go growth, because we still need some people to come out of poverty. We need to build schools there. We need to build roads there. We need to have uh, houses there. All that will require uh, 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 growth. But it is an environmentally informed growth. So we have to be very clear that every economic activity must be scrutinized for its environmental consequences. Those economic activities which, which are likely to damage the environment, we should oppose, and the government should also do that. And those economic activities which are friendly to the environment, they should be promoted. Now, these days, there's a lot of talk in the newspaper and in the media about demand for cars coming down in India, and that is one of the consequences of uh, slow economic growth or the manifestation of uh, slowdown in economic growth. Now, it is an obsession with car. 
You know, we should say that, okay, it's good actually if there is a less demand for cars. Cars are not good. What we need is more efficient public transport. And that public transport should be good so that women can also travel. No one can trouble them. And, and so we need to redesign our security forces. We need to re-educate people. So, so that's what I would say, that there is a trade-off between economy and environment, but that trade-off can be resolved by promoting those economic activities which are environmentally friendly and stopping or decreasing one of the things could be we can be we can start becoming more and more vegetarian now you might ask me how does that help the environment there is a very good research which shows that the resources which are required to raise animals you know cattle and 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 so on and so forth are many times more than the resources required to raise vegetarian food okay I, I'm not saying out of any religious consideration. I'm saying purely out of scientific environmental consideration. Okay, so you can change your food habits. Okay, and and you can you can you can think about not consuming things which are environmentally damaging, and and maybe buying less clothes. That that could be one consideration. And when you go for shopping, don't get uh, seduced by buy two get the third one half price. You know, marketing will go on and. Similarly, we can put pressure on the firms. There's a movement in uh, the advanced countries that they are forcing big corporations not to invest in oil and gas because oil and gas are major polluters. And there is, there is a movement in Ecuador called keep oil, in the, keep oil in the soil, keep coal in the hole. That the moment oil comes out, it is going to burn. When it burns, it's going to create uh, a carbon dioxide emission. Similarly, the moment you drug coal, Coal is going to be used, it'll create, you know, greenhouse, it'll going to have carbon dioxide emissions. So we want to let the coal stay there where it is. We need to think about new, uh, so those economic capital. At a philosophical level, what we need to start thinking about is the relationship with the non-human living beings. We haven't given enough importance that this earth is not meant only for human beings. This earth is also meant for animals, also meant for birds, also meant for insects, also meant for trees. And we, can we create a world where we do not dominate over them? Human beings are certainly more intelligent than them, but intelligence doesn't necessarily mean that you have to dominate over them. Not only dominate, you actually destroy them. Human beings have been destroying all the other living species at a massive rate, and that's called biodiversity loss. My biodiversity loss is very, very massive. The, the, the scale at which species are dying is phenomenal. What species used to die in 1,000 years, they're dying in 10 years. So philosophy should reflect on this. You know, so far, philosophy has been mainly concerned with human beings, okay? But we need to go beyond human beings. I've been doing a lot of lectures in the last few days on Guru Nanak, and because of the 550th anniversary of Guru Nanak's birth. And I've reflected on this. I read Guru Granth Sahib, and one of the key insights by reading Guru Granth Sahib was I found that Guru Nanak was acutely aware of the relationship between human beings and the non-human beings. So that's why he says, Pavan Guru, Pani, Pitat, Mata, Tartamat, you know, and that he actually raises them to the status. He calls the air as, as our guru, as teacher, and, and water as a father, and the earth as a mother. So, so we, philosophically, we need to think about environmental philosophy. And in, 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 in America, there is a very serious debate which is taking place. This is called new, Green, Green New Deal. Green New Deal is a reference to what happened after the Great Depression in 1929-33, where America gave a lot of support to Europe to, you know, to, to develop economically. What they're saying is that we don't need to just develop economically. We, we, the New Deal should be green informed deal, that we should do, develop the infrastructure, uh, public transport, generation of electricity, electric charging points, which is compatible with the policies to protect the environment.